one to the two, two to the three. Yes, it's me in a place to be. BQ, King of the Mountain Podcast, welcome. Special welcome if you're a brand new listener of the show. Would really appreciate if you hit that subscribe button on whatever platform it is you are listening on, especially if it is on YouTube. I'm getting ready to hopefully hit my 600th subscriber within the next week or so. And that's uh, it's one of the big goals in the social media world because for whatever reason with the uh, YouTube algorithm, once you start exceeding 600, the uh, reach is a little bit further with your videos. So please hit that subscribe button and a thumbs up if you're on YouTube and if you're on a Apple Podcasts or SoundCloud or Stitcher or wherever it is, Podbean, please hit subscribe. Would greatly appreciate it. Usually it's the point where I give a shout out to all the other podcasts and podcasters out there that I'm close to or that fight the good fight for the Global Force Wrestling brand. But sometimes when I just start listing off a bunch of podcasts, it becomes kind of some fluff. So what I'm going to be doing is highlighting a podcast each week and doing a podcast spotlight here on the YouTube channel. So I'll basically say, you know, this is the uh, podcast I'm highlighting this week and I will upload one of their podcasts to this channel, all their information and see if we can get their reach out there a little bit more and turn you guys on to some really good show. So this week, my special guest co-host is my man, Delvin. How you doing today, my man? Good. How you doing, man? It's an honor to be on this podcast. Definitely, man. I love King of the Mountain podcast. Good. I appreciate it, man. And I was uh, just on yours a couple of days ago, so... That was a lot of fun. I haven't been interviewed in a while. I was, but more when I was doing the music thing. But as far as a uh, on a wrestling podcaster level, I have not been interviewed. So that was a lot of fun. When uh, you think you're going to put that out? This upcoming Thursday. But speaking of which, tell uh, the listeners about your podcast. Hello, everybody. I'm the host of the Delvin Cox Experience. It's not a wrestling podcast. It's more of a I guess you could say lifestyle podcast. I talk about everything and I talk to all sorts of people from all sorts of walks of life. It don't matter where you're from. It's just getting experiences from different people, getting the outlook on things. Sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's negative. But it's cool to hear a different side of a story from all walks of life. Did you ever did you ever do any podcasting for wrestling? No, but I have a lifelong love of wrestling and I <laughs> listen to a lot of wrestling podcasts. This is my main one I would listen to for Impact Wrestling. Like, I literally have watched wrestling my whole life. I've been a, I was a WWE fan when it was WWF. I loved WCW. I was a big WCW fan in terms of like Sting and the NWO and Goldberg. And I loved T- Impact Wrestling, which was formerly TNA. I got into that because it was. It reminded me a lot of WCW in its heyday. I agree with you. Like, there's there's a lot of aspects about the company that is is kind of old school, and people always say they want certain elements from the old school, but then when you get it, you don't really want it. So, <laughs> but um, no, there's a lot. Of, there is some. There's definitely some comparisons. Um, but no, I'm gonna put you the uh, information for your podcast in the description of this video. But we'll uh. When, when you release the one with me, I'll definitely help get it out there. Probably put it on my channel here as well. So I'm going to keep this opening super short this week since last week's was so long. I think it exceeded about 45 minutes. So we're going to keep it short here and jump into Impact Wrestling. Maybe I'm a mark, man. I, I freaking like this show so much. Uh, there, there are some parts that I didn't care for and we'll get into it. But I really think ever since they came back from India... The shows have been extremely strong. I, I don't know what you thought of the India shows. I thought the India shows were great. I think this one, to me, this one was a misstep. It was a lot of things that I liked about the show, but there's some things I'm like, huh. When, when we go through the matches, I'll tell you which ones I was like a little bit like, huh, I don't know about this one. I think I, the way I kind of summed it up to someone today is that the first hour and 15 minutes was really good, and then it just like, fell off a cliff. It, <laughs> it, it, th- it just kind of hit a wall. I, I think I can agree with that. I think that was kind of my synopsis of it. I remember I looked at the time and about like an hour 15 passed and I was like, man, this show is killing it today. You know, I I was like, man, this is going to be 
one you know best show of the year best show and you know but then it ended up kind of kind of becoming um on par with the last few but you know overall i really enjoyed it so they kicked it off with a match well before the match started the uh the mayor of orlando buddy dyer was introduced and he was the guest ring announcer i was a little concerned he was going to ring announce the whole show because he was not good but he's not a ring announcer so i'm not trying to like disrespect it dude but you know, the people are ring announcers for a reason. I was very concerned he was going to do the entire night. And it was going to come up. And I, I was worried because I thought it was going to come off super amateurish to people who didn't really understand it was impact day and everything. But we kicked it off with this six man match. Looking at this match, did you think this was going to be a good match? I liked all the players in the match. I love Eli Drake. I love. EC3, I like Moose. I like so I thought it was gonna be a competitive fun match to start off the show with. It was EC3, Eli Drake, and the fabulous Chris Adonis versus Moose, Eddie Edwards, and Marafuji. And on paper, I was really excited about this. I recorded a uh, preview for the for uh, Impact yesterday. I just never uploaded it to YouTube because it got a little bit late in the day. But in my preview, I was saying this match had the potential to be really good, but it had the potential to be really bad too. Uh, excuse me? Just because I, you know, I was I was concerned maybe we get too much Chris Adonis in the ring. I want to talk about that for a second too. Is it me or has he lost a lot of weight? He looks like he slimmed down quite a bit. Yeah, it, it, it was, it's like jarring how much he slimmed down. It, it, it I couldn't take my mind off from the, during the match. Like, he's really small now. He was somebody when he debuted years and years ago. I thought he was going to be a superstar. And this was back when, you know, big guys were a little bit more popular. I really thought he was going to be something very special. I did, too. I thought he was going to be the next Lex Luthor. Yeah, and then he be- then he almost became... When he had the whole Master Lock thing and the Master Lock challenge, like, that was all pretty cool. And then he turn into this it wasn't a comedy character but he was always like making his pecs dance the music and stuff like that and that i don't know when, once you start going into any kind of comedy that's usually a black hole for most wrestlers not all but i, I don't know if you remember this but lex luger kind of had a very similar gimmick when he was at wwe a long long time ago he was a narcissist yeah the uh after the narcissist gimmick was over and he started becoming that all American guy, that's when I really stopped watching for several years. Um, so I don't quite remember too much about Luger and the company, but, but yeah, he just, uh, I thought he was destined for super, super stardom and it just didn't happen. And I haven't been a huge fan of him in this company so far. I'm not saying get rid of the dude and fire him. I'm just haven't been a crazy fan, but this match for me really over delivered from what I thought that it would be. I was saying a couple weeks ago on the podcast, don't know if you feel the same when Marafuji took on Moose. I thought, I thought we were cheated out of how good Marafuji was because Moose dominated a lot of the match. He uh, no sold some of Marafuji's chops. I felt super cheated. Well, you hit it right on the head. Cause honestly speaking, I knew very little about Marafuji. And when I saw that match with him and Moose, I was like, ugh. And then when seeing him tonight, it was a almost like a 180 on him. I was like, huh, this guy's actually pretty good. I was very impressed by him, to say the least. And it's, I wasn't so impressed by Chris Adonis in the match. I think I think that Eli Drake's going to be a star. It's only a matter of time where he's going to be the guy, I think. He has a, a lot of potential. And his... His mic skills are phenomenal, and I think it's only a matter of time before he gets to that level. Right now, he is, uh, I was saying on a vlog earlier that he's kind of that modern-day Roddy Piper getting over with his mic skills, but it's not really translating to wins necessarily. Hopefully, we start to see that. I'm not going to get into the punches and kicks of the match, but the uh, bad guys (laughs) ended up winning EC3. I won't say he debuted a new move because he uses his slam anniversary on James Storm. 
it was a uh, virgin version of virgin version of the angel, <laughs> angel wings. Um, and he calls it the ECD. I don't like that name at all. Ethan Carter no. driver is what it stands for. It. It's banned in 49 States. So I, I kind of like that, but I felt like he could have come up with a better name. I don't like when stuff sounds like DDT or some kind of version of DDT. Cause the DDT has become the most played out move in wrestling aside from the super kick. So I just don't like the name, but it's good to see him get another move because the one percenter, the one percenter looks good when it's on a uh, smaller guy, but because EC3 mainly wrestles the heavyweights, they don't know how to sell that move at all. It doesn't look devastating at all. If he does it like the other day, he did it on Eddie Edwards, and he just planted his ass in the middle of the ring. But if he does it like on James Storm or Lashley or El Patron, or something like that, it doesn't look good. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, so this is a and and he he's using that TK three too, which is he hasn't hit that one clean in forever. Because again, just with the heavyweights, they just don't know how to take the move. Um, they usually they usually get their knees up, and it just looks really bad. So, you know, maybe this is gonna be the new finisher for him. I really like it for him. Uh, when this match was over, I couldn't help but to think how money the EC three and Eli Drake pairing would be if they they were to team up. Yeah, that's actually a very good idea. I think they have both of those guys, in my opinion, are stars for one thing. And the only thing about teaming them up is I think they'll be they're so good as singles competitors. It's kind of like, huh, how long can you really go with them as a tag team before you're like, you know what, let's split them up and let them do their own thing. You know what I'm saying? Because Yeah, because we're not in that era anymore where they – team up main eventers as tag teams you know every going back to the 80s with the mega powers and you know it was never a long-term gig but they used to sometimes you know put together the warrior and macho man the warrior and hogan something like that you know that that was back in the days um modern day wrestling is usually like tag teams or tag teams they they'll they'll put a makeshift team together if they're like two guys who aren't doing anything but as far as two guys with main event potential they have not I can't think of a company that's done that in a while. Maybe someone can prove me wrong, but I could really see something special if they if they paired them up. But you know, that's that's very unlikely to happen. Yeah. But it could, it would be cool. Yeah, it it would be pretty cool. I think it would be cool, but I I, I always like the thing where you can have the tag team, but you could also have the guy go after the singles titles too. Yes. So there was. Do it that way. I would like that a lot. Right. They could be one of those modern day teams. And I haven't seen this much in wrestling. I think uh, like Stone Cold and Triple H did it in the early 2000s. I can't think of another company or another era where it was done where somebody held all the titles. Like one is the world title. One is the mid-card title. And then they both hold the tag titles. Oh, well, no. Uh, they did that in TNA. No, they did it with, uh, with I think, Fortune did it. Uh, held all the titles or the main event, main event mafia, something like that. I think it was a main event mafia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it was. A, yeah, but I think they just held all the titles. It wasn't. I don't think they had multiple champions. Someone off the. Uh, my, my like I said, my history with the company sometimes isn't really good. I, I block a lot of things out. See, see, with me in wrestling, no, I say with me with this company. Once someone like leaves the company, they're dead to me. <laughs> it's you know like Mike Ben and Matt Hardy they're already like so dead to me it's not even funny I, I it's like I just kind of put their past accomplishments I, I compartmentalize it somewhere and just move forward or do you want to talk about the Mike Bennett thing right now since you mentioned him man I'm I, I'm really disappointed in Mike Bennett he had never really appeared to have issues with the company it appeared that he had some issues with Dixie Carter because he had the tweet of bad business continuing to be run when uh, Corrigan didn't k- take over the company. So he was obviously a Corrigan guy. Let's, you know, get that out there. But, you know, he, he him and Maria have both ha- never had anything bad to say about the company publicly. They're always, like, very big supporters, especially him. You know, I remember him getting on podcasts and saying, you know, even if you don't support the company, support the wrestlers. And, you know, he some tweets have resurfaced of his where he was talking about how much money he, he made and that he got paid to do this. And then yeah. for him to immediately pander 
to the WWE audience when someone someone had said you were a joke in Impact and you're a joke now, and he responds with basically, you know, I'm paraphrasing that he said, "Well, I get paid now." Uh, it's possibly he it's possible that he meant I make more money now. That's very possible. That is what he meant. But if he was if he was trying to flip that narrative that and I anti TNA narrative of he wasn't getting paid on time and all that bull crap. Yeah. I always find it corny when wrestlers after they leave a company that's done so much for them, whether you left on good terms or bad terms, go back and take shots at them for what you're, you're, you're supposedly in a better place now. So be happy and move on with your life. He even said himself, he was going to resign with the company before, you know, Kevin Owens stepped in and, and, uh, got him to change his mind but you know sienna went on record i know for a fact saying that and she came to the company just a little bit after him saying she's never been paid late in her tenure with the company so it's it's just this narrative that people want to push that hasn't really been an issue for a while it wasn't even a huge issue under dixie towards the end i think maybe towards the end end when the whole uh, bound for glory might not happen thing you know i think it might have been an issue then but there were not as many pay issues in 2016 as in the past. So it's, I'm very, I'm really disappointed and I would never publicly just trash a dude because he was very nice to my kids in impact zone. Uh, when we went him and Maria both were, but I'm really disappointed in him. So you mean he didn't tell your kids to go away and get yelled at by Karen Jarrett? <laughs> <laughs> There was another report with that that came out saying it was it was they said it was her and him were both drunk and there wasn't altercation, but they said it was so blown out of proportion. It wasn't as dramatic as that initial report came out where he was like on his knees. Oh, man, that was just a, a doozy of a story, to say the least. Yeah, you could tell when you read that article. It was reported by Melter, too. <laughs> yeah, he is the... He is batting below 500 with his news, to say the least. Dude, he is, man. Like, I, I was saying, I don't really think he's as anti-company as people say he is, but he, he does have an agenda. He has, he knows yeah. his audience want to hear that dirt. I, you know, I, I don't want to say I broke the news by any means, but I put it out to a lot of people where I explained the 10% thing. I explained the 100% merchandise thing. And then uh, Ed Norholm came came out and said the same exact thing I said. So how did I get this information? But Meltzer's narrative is, they're, you know, they're blackballing the wrestlers. Because you, you can make up whatever narrative you want to fit your story. That's bottom line what he's doing. If you want to make TNA's, well, excuse me, GFW sound positive, you're going to make it sound positive. You want to make it sound negative? You're going to make it sound negative. That's basically what it is. Yep, good old Dirty Dave. Are you calling me a liar? So the next match of the evening was the Super X Cup. Um, uh, Ishimori versus Davey Richards. This match right here. Uh, I really thought it was going to be a little slower than the other matches, which maybe it was. It, it was a, as a technical match. It was excellent. And... I think this was the best match of the opening round so far. And for me, I've gotten every prediction wrong except Desmond Xavier winning because that one was obvious. But the other three I've actually got wrong. <laughs> so I'm, I'm one for four so far. I like this match a lot. But it kind of killed it for me. The fact that his letter came out, and it was like, oh, this is probably why this happened. You know what I'm saying? No, I don't. <laughs> what are you the talking fact about? That um, Davy Richards lost, and he's gonna be leaving the company soon. Well, I think when this was going on, I don't think he made that determination yet. It sounded you like to me, so? no, it sounded to me like it was something that he that that kind of hit him out of nowhere here. And it's kind of rumored that him and Angelina are having some issues right now. So I think that played a role into it. Because if you go to Davey Richards' Twitter, the first thing it says is single dad. Oh, oof. So there's something going on there. I think that played a role along with the med school thing. Uh, 
then that, that kind of makes sense. Because it looked from, because once I read the letter, then I saw the match. I'm like, oh, that kind of explains why he lost. Because I thought he was going to win, honestly speaking. I thought he was going to win the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking that exact same thing, too. I, You know, I actually can't call this. I don't know who's going to win the entire thing. Which is exciting. I like the fact that you, you can't call it. That's a good thing. And it's four baby faces. Huh, there, there's not a heel in the group there. I didn't even realize that until you said that. That's interesting. Very interesting. So I guess next week we're going to get, well, the next two weeks we're going to get the other semifinal matches, and then at Destination X we'll get the the final match. So this is this thing has really delivered so far. This, um, you know, there were a couple matches that were a little flat with the crowd only because, you know, last week we had uh, Guevara and Drago, but the crowd wasn't quite filling in in the impact zone yet. Um, there was a storm that night. Well, storm for this night too. But, um, you know, I, I don't think the matches have gotten over with a crowd as much as they should have, but they these are really know, good. You know, I noticed something when I was watching it last night, the crowd, I don't know if it's the, if, if it's the sound engineering, but that crowd looks like they were pumped. It just doesn't come off as well on TV. If you listen to the sound of the entrance music compared to the announcers, you can see how compressed the audio is of the actual event compared to the announcers. Like their the their audio settings are so that the announcers you can hear them crisp and clear. But you you can see it, and, and there there's some people in that front front row there that just are just standing there. Uh, let's, you know, call a spade a spade. But if you really look sometimes, there there's people who appear pumped and appear to be screaming, and it's just not coming off. And I, I've said it a million times. I can beat this dead horse. My listeners are tired of hearing me say it. I can guarantee, but the audio does not translate on TV what it is in the arena. Because I noticed it a lot in the final match. It's like It was like evident. And I've told people too, you know, when people say it's a bunch of tourists, like look, make it a point to look at the different parts of the crowd during the evening, you know, especially, especially easy for me when I go live, but even watching on TV, there's, there's parts of the crowd that react to different people and different things. There's just not a full, um, not cooperation, but participation from the crowd for everything. But if you look around, it's it's there's just bits and pieces, you know, in the bleachers, there's this guy in the middle, you know, a group in the middle, or it's to the left, or it's to the right, or it is the front row people. There it's it's just very spotty. Yes. And um they really started waking up when uh you know in the in the opening match they weren't super loud until Marafuji started delivering all the delivering all those kicks to Chris Adonis. And then all of a sudden it started. Yeah, that was so badass. It wasn't even funny. And then all of a sudden they started picking up. So, you know, they, they just, you got to work a little harder for their affection there and their participation, but it, it's not as dead as people want to say we get after this. Um, so Ishimori wins this 450 splash. Great match. Uh, there were a lot of instances where you thought one or the other was going to win. So it was, it was very back and forth and believable. And Davey's a great heel. I'm going to do a vlog on his heel work later, so I don't want to say too much on him. But let's move on. Uh, we get the last knockout standing match. I had to watch this again right before the podcast because my uh, daughter took the phone. I was watching on Hulu. My daughter took the phone last night to watch this match. So Yeah, I had uh, a similar problem. <laughs> yeah, so... <laughs> She's she's with me for the summer, so uh, you know my kids like wrestling. They're very casual fans, though. I mean, but uh, my daughter really knows WWE. Uh, she's starting to learn Global Force a little bit from when she comes with me, but or comes to stay with me. But yeah, she saw Rosemary and was and was was locked in, and she ended up liking seeing a lot too. So she she took the phone and she watched it. Uh, so I just watched it before this. I really enjoyed this. I read a review, uh, you know, saying that it, it wasn't dissing it, but it was just basically it was, you know, a lack drama and it wasn't very special. Like, I actually thought this, I like this better than the one with Jade. Uh, maybe, I like this match a lot. 
Yeah, maybe because I like Sienna and Rosemary. Or I like them both better than I like Jade. So maybe that has to, you know, that plays a role in it. But yeah, so what were you thinking about this one? I thought it was a great match. I enjoyed it a lot. I, the physicality of it was excellent, to say the least. You know, it's cool to see how Impact le- kind of lets their girls just go at it. Whereas you'll watch other shows, not that I want to call no names, but you'll you'll see it's kind of a little bit more reserved and like less stuff. So when Impact does it, like this match is, they're going at it. They're going at it just as hard as the guys are going at it. And I enjoyed it a lot. So as Sienna was getting into the ring, Rosemary runs up, just rushes up and kicks her in the face. And I've talked about this a lot on previous shows. They do a really good job of when two people are in the ring it is, uh, and they have a blood feud or there's, you know, some serious problems. One of them always attacks the other, whether it's what she just did or at Slammiversary when Davey and Angelina were coming down and um, Eddie and Alicia came and just attacked them from behind. Like, that's how you, that's how you get heat over and that's how you start the match off. One thing that bothers me a great deal is if you got two people who supposedly hate each other. And then they start with a collar and elbow tie up or something ridiculous like that. See that a Bad lot. That's the psychology. Yeah. I see that a lot in wrestling. So what the, about the, that, that red wedding? <laughs> there were some spots in this match, the red wedding onto the chair. chair. There was that AK 47 on the outside where oh. she dropped Rosemary. Um, there was the tarantula outside in the crowd crowd went nuts for that yeah god what else was there there and there was obviously the finish of the match where she went through the table she went through that table perfect looked like she was dead she wasn't moving and then the way that sienna just kind of rolled out and landed on her feet that was really good it was good storytelling too i think where she did the red wedding it knocked her out and km helped her get up you know he didn't get overly involved in the match but i thought that was good placement for him but yeah, that what was you, good. What do you think of KM, though? I like him. I want to see him do more. Not necessarily in a knockouts match, per se, but I want to see him do more things. He needs to kind of step away from her. I was really impressed his uh, first match against Braxton, Braxton Sutter. I liked the vignettes he was doing, as corny and cheesy as they were. And I think he does a good job of you know, kind of a high school bully gimmick, but type of humor, like egging people on type of thing. But there's a little bit of comedy to him that I think they need to pull away on. Cause you know, there's a, when you have someone that big, there's no way they can be a monster if they're doing funny stuff. There's not many big guys who can be monsters and be funny at the same time. Honestly speaking. Yeah. It's very difficult to do. And as he comes out with Sienna, he almost comes out as a, like Sienna's lackey. You know what I mean? Like they're not equals. Sienna's the star there. Yeah. And um, that's the problem I have with it. Actually, he needs to kind of break off from that. So he could be seen more serious in a, in a sense. Right. I'm not as harsh on him as some people are where, uh, there's this review, uh, uh I don't know how to say his name, but I'm four one one mania. The guy that, writes reviews and everything and he's always like hey i'm such a waste of space and this i don't feel that harshly about him at all i, no, I no. do enjoy him but there's just some tweaks that they got to do if they're going to make him you know a serious competitor you know if he's always he always like you said always involved with the knockouts you know like just kind of get out and do his thing i don't know if there's a feud out there for him right now though you know the brax the brax and sutter kind of unceremoniously just ended i guess it's because you know the had that pre-show match at Slammiversary, but I don't know. So this match, though, like I said, I thought it was a lot better than the match with Jade because the match with Jade ended really, uh, I don't remember the finish exactly, but I remember it had like no drama to it other than it, it was a good match because it had tax and things like that. I think the tax they use in that match, though, were just the the uh, top. I don't think it had the, the pin because I didn't see any of them. One of them got slammed into it. It was, it was Jade or Rosemary, and I didn't see any tacks on their skin. So, But again, you know, maybe maybe I just, because I like Sienna better than Jade, I just like this one more. But 
I think they're doing a good job building Sienna to be a pretty credible heel because she's the only heel right now capable of carrying the title. So that's why my my wife asked me earlier, is Rosemary becoming a jobber now or something? And I said, no, you know, she's lost two matches in a row, but Sienna's the only credible heel to hold a title. Uh, so you can't really put the title on a baby face right now because then they got no one to beef with outside of her. You know, so, but we're supposed to be getting new knockouts soon because we got a couple departures and they've made it clear. Duchess said it, uh, Gail Kim even said it on Twitter, like, hey, you guys excited to see what new knockouts? And they said, Jeremy Borash said they sign a couple well known ones. And I don't think it's Taya because I don't think she can join the company yet, but. There's some talented girls out there. What I did is I kind of paid attention to who wasn't in that Mae Young Classic. Because I think all those girls are going to be locked down for a little bit. Because I think they signed them to some kind of bullshit contracts to where it's like not an exclusive deal. But it also kind of kind of keeps them from showing up on other shows. Yeah, that's exactly what they do. They sign them as, it's a BS deal where they get, I think like 60 days or something like that. And because they're, they're supposedly supposed to be being evaluated by the WWE to see whether they're going to go to um, NXT or whatnot. I think, you know, some people have, have brought up in rumors, oh, maybe it's Santana Garrett, maybe it's Tessa Blanchard, maybe it's, uh, uh, God, I forgot her name, and she's actually one of my favorites, uh, Ellering's daughter, Rachel Ellering. Some people think maybe it's her, maybe Jade's coming back. I'm like, no, I think they're, I think all those ladies are off limits for a little while. So, you know, I'm thinking there's a, uh, Maybe it's a far stretch, but uh, uh, God from Ring of Honor, the uh, redhead. I'm trying to think who you're talking about. Well, there's two of them. Uh, <laughs> I feel like such a loser right now. I can't remember any of their names. They're, I'm, I'm picturing both their faces in my head's right, my head right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm trying to think who it could be. Oh my God, Veda Scott, <laughs> Veda, and um. Oh my God! The one that was with House of Truth and Jay Lethal for the longest time, Jesus Christ! She was in it TNA a long time ago. Now I'm gonna look it up. Right now, people are like screaming oh, at their sure phone or whatever, like you freaking idiot. You're worthless. Oh my God, we're go we're gonna get back to that. <laughs> you definitely have to get I'm back so to that. mad at myself right now. I'm very embarrassed as a podcaster right now that I cannot remember this person's name. And he's a much bigger joke than I'll ever be. I'm going to move on here. Taylor, so, Taylor, Taylor Hendricks, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, like I said, people right now are screaming at their phones like, idiot. <laughs> no, but that was one of the bigger names that I you know, I noticed was excluded. Uh, Veda Scott, too. There, there's, there's a few. Madison Eagles. Um, there's some names out there. They got a chance to really really rebuild this division. Definitely, definitely. So this was the end of the, that first like hour, the golden hour and 15 minutes of the show I was referring to. Now we get, I was looking forward to this because Trevor Lee's been doing some good work recently on the mic and everything, wrestling with the bell and all that good stuff. Says that he basically, you know, found the best high flying luchador and I knew who it was before he before he came out because once he started saying it was a luchador, I'm like, okay, it's gonna be someone that's that's there, obviously. And uh, Octagoncito comes out, you know, and they didn't build this as a, a comedy match by any means. He did the whole palm on the forehead where he was swinging. I I don't like that little gimmick. But the interesting thing is here that Trevor Lee actually got himself disqualified or not disqualified, but counted out. I don't know if people like this or not. I didn't mind it, but it was the beginning of the downhill slide for the show. Yeah. Oh, that second hour was rough, to say the least. I, I don't know what the what the the end game is here with this Trevor Lee hijacking the title. Because Destination X is coming up pretty soon, so they gotta figure I, they gotta do something with this title here soon. I don't know what is what it is they're doing. Maybe he he's trying to ca cash in option C, even though he's not the title holder. But I don't know what they're doing with it. I don't understand why Sanjay is banned from the building, and obviously Bruce keeps popping his head in there. So people think it's a lack of common sense, um, 
lack of good storytelling. I just think there's a bigger picture to it. I'm not. That's what I think it is. I'm not over analyzing it like that. Like, surely they're not that dumb. And I was like, hey, we got way too much Bruce Pritchard this show. It was. <laughs> um, yeah. I feel like Bruce Pritchard could sue me for slander and probably have a case. I, r- I really don't enjoy him at all. I think he, I, I just think he's a bad on screen character. And I don't know, he he just has a voice that, well, the minute he starts talking, I just want to walk up and slap him. I don't mind him. But see, I think the problem with with my feelings about Bruce Perkinson is the fact that I like his podcast a lot. But then when you listen to his podcast, you kind of realize he never was really an on-air talent that you'll be seeking. Like, for example, for example, Eric Bischoff. If Eric Bischoff was there doing what Bruce Pritchard was doing, it would be a lot more believable. Because that's what we know him for. Even Vince Russo. That's what you know know him for. So when you see Bruce Pritchard doing it, it doesn't come off as believable as it would with almost anybody else. You make a very good point there. He it's it's not believable at all. What he does when he comes out, it's not believable that he's in charge, that he's calling the shots, that he's controversial. It's like no one really cares. It's just not a good character on screen. And yeah. you know, being an on screen character isn't always easy. You know, um Mackenzie used to be really bad doing her backstage interviews and, and uh she's improved a lot. Like there was that segment with Richard Justice and <laughs> you know, he's the standby wrestler and he said, I'm just on standby. She's like, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard. You know, like that was the most, uh, just that sentence alone was the most personality she's ever shown, but she's, she's growing a lot. But you know, Bruce is Bruce's character. It's, I, I don't really get it. I don't understand it. And I, I see they're kind of doing a heel thing with him. And I, you know, it's a rumor that they're going to have some kind of storyline between him and Dutch, which I, I don't think is a good idea. Not at all. No. Um, <laughs> to say the least, that is a bad idea. Only way I want to see Bruce Pritchard out there is if he's brother love. <laughs> That's about it. Right, exactly. That's his his heyday. One good thing I'll say about Bruce Pritchard is... Then we get a video package for OBE and... Uh... <laughs> Oh man, no! <laughs> I'm not gonna be saying up. I want to see where everybody got that. Yeah, <laughs> sitting there in suspense. What's he gonna say? Oh man! But we got a video package for OVE, which is uh, Dave Chris and Jake Chris. Um, I know when they were debuting. I know for a fact. I'm not gonna say because it it's a spoiler, but I know for a fact when they were debuting because I uh, in contact with someone who's very close to them. So uh, she confirmed with me that, you know, they did sign, that it wasn't a rumor or anything like that. But I know when they're coming. Uh, just not going to say it. But I think it's much going to be a much-needed shot in the arm for the tag division. Hopefully they come in as heels because they need, you know, LAX needs some counterparts on that heel side there. Uh, because with the baby faces, you know, you got VOW, Reno, Reno Scum, Laredo Garza, and Garza. So it's becoming a very talented tag division. They're, they're, uh, it's almost like the Hardys leaving was the best thing that could have happened to that tag division. Yeah, it really was. Cause it, the Hardys, and I, this comes from folks who like the Hardys there. In, in retrospective, it kind of hindered not only the tag division, but impact in a whole because it became the Hardy show in a sense. Right. And, uh, you know, it wasn't with them towards the end it was never about the wrestling it was about the out of the arena shit so yeah they, it, they did a lot of damage to the tag division and once they kind of damaged dcc and decay you know they've done a pretty good job of, of bouncing back from that so uh another backstage thing we had this was before the super x cup match but this was um lashley coming out which wasn't really looking forward to this lashley calling out bruce i want a world title shot but then it got interesting because Matt Seidel came out, and I was concerned he wasn't going to because this was this was something Vince Russo would have lost his mind over if if Lashley would have come out said I want a world title shot, uh, world title shot, and the segment is just between him and Bruce. 
because Vince Russo would say, what about the guy that he beat up last time? Does he not care? Does he not want revenge? Yeah. So very good touch for him to come back in. And this is going to be interesting at destination X. They made it a point to make this match for destination X. They're calling it a shot versus shot match. Uh, Lashley versus Matt Seidel. And then the winner gets the title shot of their choice. Now, if you remember last week, Matt Seidel had called out Bruce that he wanted a title shot, but he didn't necessarily say it's implied, but he didn't necessarily say that it was for the X division. So that could be a cog in this thing, a little, little wrench, you know, a little, little curveball. but what do you think could possibly happen with this Lashley Matt Seidel thing? Do you think, you think it's going to be an easy Lashley win to just throw him back in a world title picture a world title picture or are you going to get some kind of swerve here? I think Lash is going to end up getting screwed. I think if they're going to go with the whole Bruce Pritchard the heel thing, they're going to have to f- figure out a way to make people hate him. And I think him screwing Lashley might be the way to do it. Yeah, but Lashley is an on-screen heel. Well, this might be the opportunity to turn him face. It would be a good because, opportunity to do that, but because if you look at him, the fact that he called out Bruce Pritchard and he basically called Bruce Pritchard on his BS, like hold up, everybody else this supposed to be the land opportunity, but yet I'm getting screwed over in this situation, and in a way, it's kind of true. Bruce Pritchard's character is not consistent, and that's the problem with his character. Oh yeah, it's 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 the the least consistent thing on this whole show. Week in and week out. So there's some confusing things going on in the stories right now. And I I hope that it all makes sense when Destination X rolls up. I hope it's not the cluster that it's appearing to be. I hope it just all eventually makes sense. And maybe it's maybe it's done to throw you off the scent, you know, because there's some wrestling shows you turn on and you just know exactly what's happening. And, you know, maybe maybe we're just so so used to knowing exactly what they're doing that it comes this this is coming off as some kind of cluster and, and maybe it's not so we'll see uh Matt Seidel did get a shooting star press on Lashley here so that was cool he did get the upper hand so this is this is going to be interesting I'm excited because it's something different for Lashley because Lashley's been fighting the same fools for the last you know last year it's EC3 this Eddie Edwards that El Patron that yeah pretty much yeah, so this is something new for him. So this will be, I think it'll be exciting. All right, so after Trevor Lee versus Octagoncito, which Trevor Lee lost, we get the um, we get the segment with Grado and Laurel. Uh, what what is this doing for you? As far as you know, I don't know if you find Grado very funny. There's times where I do find him funny. I probably like him more than the average person. But uh, what are you making of this whole segment so far? I like Grado a lot. I did not like this segment at all. My whole thing is that it seemed like they were coming to an end with this segment, segment, and then they just added this new wrinkle to it, and I was like, why? Like, okay, the whole date thing last week was cute, and it was adorable, and it was funny, and then we get to the whole proposal thing, and we don't get an answer for it. Right, that's kind of how I looked at it too. Last week they did the date. I thought I found the first part of the date pretty funny, and then I found the second part where they're outside looking at the stars. I didn't care for that. So that's kind of how I was feeling with this one too. She came out, and you know the storyline is okay, but she came out, and then he, you know, he had the ruffled the ruffled suit, and you know, the corny, um, corny pickup, not corny pickup lines, but just, uh, corny compliments and proposes to her. And I was, <sighs> then Congo Kong comes out. And to me, he really slowed up the segment because it takes him forever to get to the ring. He doesn't talk. He just kind of picked her up and left, scared them out of the ring. And what I didn't like is that it just dragged the storyline another week to where we don't even know if they're getting married yet. So it'd be one thing if Laurel's like, yeah, you know, yes. And then they start moving on towards a wedding, but that didn't happen. So now we're going to get another week of him trying to court her or trying to get a, you know, answer from her. So I just felt Congo Kong coming out kind of unnecessarily dragged it out, but you know, 
Yeah, because my whole thing was I was looking at it like, well, maybe this could be the situation to snap her out of the whole thing in a sense where, OK, she says yes or whatnot. They get to the wedding and she's like, no, I'm not marrying you. And she just leaves. She snaps out of the whole thing and she's back to being Law Van Nessen again because you have to at some point get her back to where she needs to be at so she can. Because the knockout division is strong, but it's not where it needs to be at because where it. Excuse me, where it needs to be at right now, and she would be a good addition to have her back in the ring on a consistent basis. Yeah, we need her back in the division badly because it's it's basically Sienna holding it down for the um, the heel side, and this gimmick is I do enjoy it quite a bit. That dress is absolutely filthy, but they need to start working towards how do we snap her back to normal. And I know you brought up, you know, maybe her standing him up at the altar will do that. So that's what this could get kind of interesting, but the segment went on a little bit too long. I just, the Congo Kong inclusion makes sense. I just, you know, like I said, it, it just unnecessarily is dragging it out in my opinion. So we'll see what happens with this further. Um, then we get the main event. I know you didn't like this. No, <laughs> I didn't like it. I don't know if anyone did non-title match. This is a, uh, Alberto El Patron versus three members of LAX in a gauntlet match. Now, Alberto and Lashley beat these guys clean a couple weeks ago. And more often than not, Alberto seems to be standing tall on what's supposed to be the most dangerous and dominant faction in professional wrestling and definitely in the company. And it's always uh, about Alberto. He's getting the Superman push. And... I mean, Homicide in there trying to show him how an OG does it and loses <laughs> in about 30 seconds. Talk about this match, man. It's, I don't like it. I didn't like it at all. And this, one of the things I didn't like about it, the fact that, like you said, LAX is supposed to be a threat. But in no shape, way, or form do they seem like a threat whatsoever. If all El Patron has to do, it, he literally beat all three of them in a gauntlet match. What more is there for him to do? It's, it needs to lead somewhere, and the problem with the, the problem with where, where it's going right now is the fact that we have Slumversary coming up. Who is he going to face? This is not for a title shot, as far as we know, and even if it was, who out of LAX even seems like somebody who can challenge him or be a threat to him? Do you say Slumversary is coming up? Is it Slumversary? No, you, do you mean Destination X or yeah, well, there's that, and, you know, then Bound for Glory after that, obviously, but... Yeah, I'm mixing up the shows. <laughs> It's, it's baffling to me because you have to do something with El Patron in a sense where, okay, you want to book him like Zena because that's essentially what's happening right now. Yeah. He's getting that John Zena push where they give him these matches that seem like he's supposed to be against the odds, but the problem with it is it's not even seeming close to that. He's not only be, He didn't only beat LAX. He dominated them. Right. Squash is homicide. I think... We were excited to see him get in the ring, and I don't know what his limitations are or aren't. I don't. I thought he was wrestling on the indies, so I, I didn't think he was injured. But he goes in there, gets squashed, and then we get the gimmick double stomp finisher that beats Ortiz. And then, um, you know, I think it was good to end it with the disqualification. But end of the day, in nine minutes, he single handedly beat these guys, and then they, you know, um, attacked him as a group. I was going to say gang, gang raped. What, <laughs> what is the term? No, this is gang, gang raped us. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so they jump on. <laughs> I so badly, I was like, gang. And it's, the, the, there's some term that's escaping me. So, And what I don't like is the whole narrative of, uh, you know, because VOW, VOW, who hasn't been on TV in forever, randomly comes out. And there's this anti- United States narrative about LAX, which is, I don't get it because I know Conan's Mexican. I don't know what homicide is, but the rest of the group is all Puerto Rican and I'm Puerto Rican where we are, uh, it's a Commonwealth of the United States. We're citizens of the United States. So the whole anti thing is, is kind of silly there. Doesn't make any sense. And so what these you're guys saying is Puerto Ricans do not hate the United States. 
No, we're part of the United States. <laughs> we want we want to be the 51st state, so it makes no sense whatsoever. But VOW, who hasn't done anything in several weeks, comes out and gets helps get the upper hand. You know, his brother and dad come out there. His brother's dad took a couple shots. I feel like we're going to get his brother in the ring here at some point, but it doesn't make sense because he that he keeps standing tall. What's like, where the hell is it even going? That they, they look so weak. Everyone likes LAX. They're over. They're great heels. They're dominant, and they they look weak as shit. Oh my on god! On this episode, and I was excited for this match. I was t- I was excited, but I also knew they weren't going to win. So that's that's where I was like. What the hell they can do with this? I was concerned they were going to make him look weak, and they sure as hell did. Yeah, that. It was rough. <laughs> like, yeah, it, it was rough. And he's not feuding with the for the title with anyone. Um, so it just it just feels like when he does defend it, it's going to be very anticlimactic because there's nothing. They're not building up towards anything. And depending on what happens with the suspension, he may have to drop the title at Destination X. If he's even on the show, so this is going to be interesting. Trying, I'm trying to trust the booking here that they're going somewhere with this, but I just don't want to see this whole like. I mean, how how much was Decay devalued after losing to the Hardys and then losing multiple times to Reno Scum, who was brand new at the time? Man, I don't I don't even know what to say about this. I think on the bright side of things, I think they can salvage this. They can make it better if they would. Just- address this like next week and be like, hey, we're getting our asses kicked by El Patron. Let's bring in somebody else to LAX to handle this problem. And I'm quite sure they got somebody in mind that they can bring into the group. Maybe his brother. Yeah, I think they missed a golden opportunity to, you know, when they pretended they were adding him to the El Patron to the group and it was really his brother and his brother attacked him. And it could have been a short-term thing. He wouldn't have been part of it long-term, but I think they kind of missed an opportunity there. I don't know. There's a lot of moving parts here. I feel like, I feel like they're gonna throw some kind of swerve at us, but I, I don't know. I can't even think what it would be. It's I I was more just upset after the show was over that that um they just weren't you know the LAX is looking like this, but trying to trust what they're doing. Hopefully it's going somewhere, but who the hell knows? Yeah, I I think it's gonna go somewhere. I think they'll. I, the best way to say it, I think they're in a weird spot right now. With El Patron, because like you said, with the suspension and stuff, where can you take this? How far can you go with this before we run up on the suspension? And like, we have to address, oh, he's not here for a couple of weeks. Yeah, it's going to be weird to see how they transition from the tapings to the live show and how they handle this. But it's hard. He's so he is. They weren't joking. He is very heavily featured in this set of tapings. And they're talking about, well, we can't edit him out. I definitely see that now. So... Um, I think that's going to do it for the King of the Mount podcast this week. So uh, thanks for tuning in and uh, check out. It's, it's a Delvin Cock experience, right? Yep. You okay. got it right on the head. So I'm going to put the uh, link here in the description on YouTube and I will upload the interview he conducted with me and uh, I'll push his link when it comes out and you guys can check that out. So thanks for tuning in again this week. Please subscribe. King of the Mount podcast. We're out.